Hello. This video is a continuation of the previous one on gas field material balance, but where I include the effect of what's called water influx. So as I said before, deep underground, porous rock is naturally saturated with water. And that porous rock containing water will be in contact with an oil or a gas field. Um, and so when I produce, in this case, gas, and I drop the pressure in the gas field, you can also see a pressure drop then in the connected, the neighboring body of water. And so what will happen is that that water will expand. Also, as the, the fluid pressure decreases, the rock will compress. That will allow the volume of water in the aquifer to increase, and that aquifer is pushed into the gas field. Okay, so we call this an aquifer influx or a water influx. Sometimes it's called an aquifer drive. Um, the use of the word drive is um, archaic English. It's nothing to do with driving a car. It's simply to mean to affect something to happen. So the aquifer is affecting something. It's, it's creating um, additional recovery. Okay, so let's, let's uh, go through the equations to do that. And I'll do it as before with the uh, whiteboard. Okay, so put the whiteboard up here. So we'll, we'll start with my cartoon of a gas field, just as we had before. So I'm going to do this quite quickly and to sort of emphasize the presence of the water. And then at some time later, we'll draw exactly the same field. Okay, this isn't the world's best diagram. Not doing anything that wasn't in the last video. The well, we're obviously producing the gas. Okay, so we produced an amount of gas GP. Okay, this isn't some pressure P, this is my initial pressure PI. Now, the key thing is, right, what's new here is that I'm going to allow, as the pressure drops, water to move into the gas field. And I've got this term WE. Why is it WE rather than WI for influx, right? It refers to water. Um, I think because WI I as a subscript always refers to initial conditions. So this is WE, which is the water influx. And it is the reservoir volume of water that has moved into the gas field for a pressure P. It will be a function of pressure and time. Okay, so it's a variable. Um, but let's just go through the equations when we allow this water influx. So it would be um, exactly the same as we did before. Okay, I want to again for you. So we're going to do it quite quickly. So we know that G, the total amount of gas that's in place, is by the net to gross, that's the volume, the initial gas saturation, and then because we convert it to surface conditions, BGI. So this is what we showed in the previous video, we're not introducing any new concept here. So we so now let's look at some time later when we're at a pressure P. We know that we have our um, phi V or, or V phi, V phi net to gross, okay, SGI over VG. That is the volume of gas underground if there's no water influx. But the water influx is the reservoir volume that's moved in. So the amount of gas that remains is that minus WE. That's a reservoir volume. So we convert it to a surface volume, G. And this is G plus P, because it's the gas we had originally minus what's been uh, produced. Okay, so now let's rearrange the equations. The whole idea is not to use the V phi net to gross uh, bits, right? Replace it with. Uh, um, G, so we're going to get rid of this bit, that's GBGI. This is GBGI over VG minus WE over VG. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange um, that equation. Okay, I'm going to put GP um, on the left hand side and all the other terms on the right hand side. So it's just a little bit of algebra you should be able to see. But GP can be written as G. Okay. Then what have we got? We got one 
minus dgi over dg. Okay. And then plus, this is the key thing, plus we over dg. So that equation is the material balance equation with water in flux. So it's actually um, quite straightforward. And uh, the key thing here is we've got the first term that we've seen before, the one minus BGI over DG, that was in uh, the previous uh, video sequence. So there's nothing new here, so we will dwell on that. That's due to the expansion of the gas. But we've got this additional term, which is the water in flux, okay? So what that means is for a given pressure drop, for a given value of BG, there is additional production because the water has moved into the field. Okay, that's great, um, but there's one problem with it. Um, what's WE? So what um, is quite common in uh, reservoir engineering is what's called an aquifer model. So let me describe what, the, what that means conceptually. So we have this body of water. We know that there's been a pressure drop at the well and the water will expand, but also as the fluid pressure decreases because the rock itself is under very high pressure squeezing down on the fluid. If I reduce the, the fluid pressure, the rock compresses, so like squeezing a sponge, and that's going to lead to additional production. So you've got these two effects. The other effect you may have is that it's a function of time in that these, these aquifers may extend tens of kilometers. In fact, in the North Sea, there are extensive aquifers that extend hundreds of kilometers. And so if I reduce the pressure at the well, it may take some time before you can detect there is a pressure change uh, a long way away. There's essentially a pressure wave that diffuses through the rock. So the equations to look at this, some of them I'm going to show later in this course, um, but I'm not going to dwell on this. The equations to describe this are often solved analytically or severally analytically to create a model that says, for this type of aquifer, we will see a water influx that's this function of say pressure, change and time. That's fine. And if you pick up a standard reservoir engineering textbook, you will see these aquifer models. I'm not really gonna have the time um, to go through them. So what I'm going to do is simply present one simple aquifer model so that we can sort of press on and do things. And then if you actually are analyzing an aquifer drive and people want to, to look at more sophisticated problems, you can, it's, it's, it's not impossible. So the aquifer model I'm going to use is called the POT model. And it works if you have a relatively small, well-connected body of water that says, I drop the pressure in the gas field, I see the same pressure in the aquifer, and then the, the, it's essentially the water and rock expansion. So WE can be written as WC delta P. So what does that mean? So the water influx is W, which is the volume of the aquifer. Okay, C is the compressibility. It's the compressibility that accounts for both water and rock. Okay, they both add to production, they're both positive terms. Okay, and delta P is the pressure drop, it's the pressure change, the initial pressure minus the pressure now, so it's always a positive number. And uh, C, compressibility, you probably know what compressibility is, it's the fractional change in volume for a unit pressure change. Okay, so that makes sense then, C here, if we look at this equation, okay, C, WE is the change in volume, that then goes into the act uh, into the gas field, there's nowhere else for it to go. Okay, so WE over W is the fractional change in volume and for a unit pressure drop. Okay, that would be C. Okay, so that's the compressibility. It's compressibility of both the water and the rock. Okay, so we can write this in this equation, right? We've got GP is G1 minus BGI over BG plus. W, C, delta P, over G. Okay, so that's uh, the key equation for today. Okay, so I'm gonna circle it. And what I've underlined here are the two unknowns in the equation. So we have an equation for the gas produced is a function obviously of the fluid properties, which you can measure, but it's also got G, how much gas do you have originally in place? Okay, so that's one unknown you want to find. OK, 
Okay, and that's what we could do previously. And then WC is another unknown. Now you might say, well, isn't it W that's unknown, the size of the atom? Yeah, but it's W times the compressibility, and the compressibility can be estimated often. You know the compressibility of water, and you can estimate or measure it for the rock. But it's actually WC as a combination that's the key thing for us. Okay, so uh, those are the two unknowns. So what we're going to do now is talk about how um, we might actually analyze it, you know, given um, if you're actually given some data. So for that, I'm afraid I'm going to have to erase some of the other material because I'm not going to use it anymore. Okay. Okay, but I'm going to keep with this equation. Right, so how do we analyze it? The, uh, the idea here is we're going to do sort of traditional 1950s engineering. We're going to try and convert this into an equation of a straight line, right? Because we can uh, deal with straight lines graphically. In fact, we solve it graphically. So we convert it into an equation of a straight line. I'm going to divide by this uh, 1 minus BGI or BG term. Okay, that's going to equal G. Okay, so that's now it's on its own. I've got WC and I've got delta P, and then I divide through by one minus BG over BG. So I got BG minus actually BGI. We look at this. And then here, if again the uh, you know, colored pen, this I'm going to plot on the y axis. This I'm going to plot on the x-axis, and the this is going to be the intercept, and this is going to be the slope. So if you think of traditional, as I said, traditional um, engineering, okay. So let's now go through what it is you might see, right? So this is this is what we had before, right? Imagine that we're measuring production data. We measure the pressure. We know that, okay? We've got BG, okay? And then we've got an equation here so we can find the X and Y coordinates, okay? So let's just go through this. The initial condition, we haven't produced anything. This is the initial pressure. This is BGI, okay? X, there's no pressure drop. And these are the same, so it's, it's indetermined, y is also undetermined. Later, you actually have a value, so a number here, right? Okay, this is your pressure, this is your bg, okay? The x-coordinate has a delta p, it's always pi minus p, pi minus this pressure. It's not the difference in pressure between the two different readings, right? That's, that's obviously, you can make that zero by just having two close together readings, it doesn't make any sense. So it's always, the initial pressure, what you started with, not the last point, the started with minus the pressure now. Okay, so then you get, get values here. So you can pop those up. Okay. This is relatively uh, straightforward. So uh, let's, um, now if you don't mind, because I want to give myself a little bit of space, let's actually show um, what that's going to look like. Okay, so let's, uh, okay, so let's, Let's draw a graph. Okay, so here is my graph. What I plotted here is my GP over 1 minus BGI over BG. And here is delta P over BG minus BGI. And I'm writing it quite small, but it's it's hopefully, you know, it's all there. I'm not uh, showing anything. Now, the interesting thing here is, is actually the points, if you notice, um, slope is WC. Um, that's actually positive. So points that look like this. Um, you want to be careful that you've got zeros properly marked because we're going to look at a, an intercept. And now what you want to do is you want to find a best fit straight line okay, to do the points. Okay, so I'm not doing a very good job getting a best fit straight line. Indeed, for some reason, my cursor doesn't want me to. Oh, that's better. It wants me to do it. Right, so that's my best fit uh, straight line. Okay, so there I got it. And the intercept here is G. 
when x equals naught, these values are g, and my slope here is w c. Okay, so that's essentially what, what you have to do. And so if you're following the lecture notes, um, there are lots of, one might say, artificial examples where your given data, you plot it up, you find the intercept and the slope. Right? You can do this, obviously, on Excel, you can do it via hand. Right? Traditional reservoir engineering. Um, being given real data from a real field, of course, you can approach it in uh, exactly the same way. Um, there is software uh, that, that can do it for you, but this isn't, you know, this isn't uh, terribly sophisticated. So you can do it by hand so you really understand what's going on. Okay, so let's um, think about this. Let's first of all just you know, get units sorted out. Okay, so G, um, the traditional units, if we're uh, in field units, um, gas volumes at the surface are measured in standard cubic feet. Okay. So this would be cubic meters or standard cubic feet. And you see this is a ratio of BGs and GP, which is also measured in standard. So that's fine. Now let's look at the um, x-axis, which is a bit, a bit stranger. This is a pressure. Okay, so you can measure pressure in pounds per square inch. I've relatively little idea what a pound is, relatively little idea what an inch is, and anyway, uh, it's ridiculous. So pounds per square inch is the traditional field units of pressure and totally and utterly ridiculous. So um, I try and avoid that. So pressure could be measured in pascals. Okay. Um, what about BG itself? Uh, BG is a ratio of reservoir volume to a surface volume, and the units of BG strangely enough, our reservoir volumes uh, are measured in reservoir barrels. And that might seem strange for a gas field, but we were also going to consider oil fields as well. And then you've got oil and gas together, and you can't measure them both underground with different units. You can at the surface, because they're separated and sold differently, and underground, you know, even by um, stupid unit uh, standards, um, that's difficult. So uh, the reservoir volume is reservoir barrels, and this is standard cubic. So the units of WC could be, for instance, you can have whatever units you are, Pascals, right? And then you've got here, sorry, the, the, the units of the x-axis are going to be Pascals times standard cubic feet divided by reservoir balance. Okay, that's over BG. Okay. Then the um, units of WC are going to be standard cubic feet divided by these units, which is pascals, standard cubic feet, and reservoir barrels. So the units here, I'll put a brackets to show that they're units, okay, of WC can be, for instance, reservoir barrels per pascal, or cubic meters per pascal, or <laughs> cubic meters per pounds per square inch, it's up to you. Okay? Um, but it does mean something that is uh, physically meaningful. What WC is the strength of the actor? It says for a given pressure drop, right, measured in whatever units you want, for a given pressure drop, how much water influx is there? Okay, so reservoir barrels per pascal isn't just a crazy unit. It means something. For every pascal drop in pressure, there's a reservoir barrel of water influx. Okay, so at this stage, um, we're looking in quite good shape. We've found G, we found WC, we can predict now production, okay, because we can find GP for any given pressure drop. Okay, one last point here. Um, I recommend doing this analysis, even if you have a reservoir that you might think doesn't have an aquifer. So what often people do is they do a P over Z plot, which was in the previous um, video, and then see if it's a straight line, convince themselves it is, and that's it. But that's very misleading because actually in a P over Z plot, what you are effectively doing is you're assuming this is a constant. So a P over Z plot, if there's no aquifer, you put these points and you find the G here. And if there is an aquifer, that G is too high. So my recommendation is you do this analysis anyway, even if someone says there's unlikely to be an aquifer, do it. What happens if there's not an aquifer? Does the whole analysis collapse and you've wasted the whole 10 minutes you spent plotting the graph? No. If there's no aquifer, the slope's zero, and the intercept is G, and there's no slope. Okay, so you can do it without an aquifer. It's not some mysterious special case. Okay? So no aquifer, there will be no slope. And so the points would all be on a horizontal line, and you just read off G. Okay, so you've lost nothing. But if you deviate from a horizontal line, that tells you there's an aquifer, and actually it's independent of the aquifer model. If it deviates from a horizontal line, you have an aquifer.
There's one last point I want to cover, which is this all looks good. And in general, as you can see, just from the nature of the equations, for a given pressure drop, you produce more gas due to water at drive. So this appears to be good news, and it's good news in terms of productivity. You're essentially maintaining pressure. The, the water's moving in and keeping the pressure up. So the flow rates through the well are maintained at a high level. So that's good for production. You're producing fast, although material balance doesn't tell you the rate at which you produce. You know that you've got more pressure to push that gas out. So that's good news. But there's one bit of bad news, which means that the final recovery factor actually from um, the water drive is uh, not 90 or 95 percent. It's typically much lower, maybe 75, 80 percent. And so um, I say, well, why is that? So in order to show that, I'm afraid I want to clear out um, a lot of this because I just need some space. But why is that? And the reason why it is, as I'm erasing this physically, is that as the water moves in to uh, the gas field, it doesn't just move in and push out the gas. Um, water and gas don't mix. The water in general will like the solid surface of the rock the nooks and crannies, the small pore spaces. And so what the water does is it traps the gas in the larger pores, right? It's as though, you know, you're in a room and someone comes and sort of sneaks along the walls and blocks the doors. They like being in the narrow regions and then you're trapped inside the room. So that's what happens, you know, in the, in the sub millimeter pore spaces of the rock. The gas gets trapped in the pore spaces. And so what you have is SGI, or SG, sorry, SGR, sorry, SGI is the initial gas saturation. This is the residual gas saturation. So where the water goes, you do not push out the gas. You have a residual gas saturation, and that value is typically in the range of 0.2 to 0.5. You can actually have half the pore space with gas that's trapped. And what do I, again, say, what do I mean by trapped? I mean, if you go inside the micron size pores, the big pores with a lot of volume, there's gas in the center, but they're surrounded by water that's in all the grooves, the narrow regions and around the surface. So they're surrounded by water, they can't move. So you have this residual gas saturation. How do you know what that residual gas saturation is? Is it some sort of mystery thing that arrives from nowhere? No, you measure it in the lab. So it's a lab measurement, but you can't, you have to take a piece of rock and say, okay, I know that initially it's got gas and some water present, and then I inject some water through a piece of rock and I measure how much gas gets trapped. Okay, so this is a known. Okay, so you've got this residual gas saturation. So um, what happens with the residual gas? So let's, let's look at my schematic again. Okay. So imagine this was where the water was originally. We've got gas, so we've been producing. Okay. What actually happens is the gas saturation here is when the water has filled the reservoir, okay, the gas saturation goes from SGR to, sorry, SGI to SGR. So think about it. The water moves in. Let's um, do my blue pen to show this. The water moves in. But imagine now the water has moved in and essentially filled the entire gas field. So at this point, the water's moved in, filled the gas field, production's going to end because there's nothing else flowing apart from water. So you can start just producing lots of water. So that, that field's full. But it's not completely full of water. It's not rock completely saturated with water because we've left behind the residual saturation. So the saturation of gas, the gas saturation has gone from SGI to SGR. Okay. So now the question is, well, okay, how much, um, how much have I produced at that point? And what's the water influx? And the way of thinking about it is, well, we know what the water influx must be. Okay, let's, let's, um, let's do this. Okay, the water influx, what's the water influx? Well, it's this V phi net to gross, that's that term we already have, okay? And then before what we did is when we looked at volumes, we had V 
the gross rock volume porosity net to gross times saturation, didn't we? Well, the water influx is pushing the gas and the gas saturation goes from SGI to SGR. So the water influx is that difference, right? Why have we got this difference in saturation? Because it's been replaced by water. So the water influx is um, SGR, sorry, SGI, sorry, I keep dropping this around the wrong way. So it was SGI minus SGR. You might say, yeah, well, what's V phi net to gross? We know that, remember, okay? If we, if we remember G, its definition was V phi net to gross SGI over BGI. So the water influx is G BGI. And then here, this bit divided by SGI, so one minus. Okay. So we can calculate the water influx necessary to fill the entire field. And we do that because that tells us when there's no more production. In fact, we'll probably stop production before then because we're producing a lot of water, but it gives us the theoretical maximum. We know we're going to have to stop there. So we can calculate this. We know G because we've done the graph. We know BGI. We've measured SGR. We've measured SGI. So this is a known quantity. Right, we know it. OK, so that's, that's great. Um, so we put WE in here. And that's going to calculate the recovery. But there's one little snag is we also need to find the pressure drop. Because if we look at this equation for the gas produced, it relies on knowing BG, doesn't it? Right? We need to know BG and we don't know BG, right? Because BG is a function of pressure. So in this equation, we just write this as WC delta P and we find So the water influx is WC delta P. WC we also know now, okay, I'll put a tick there because we've got the graph, we've measured the slope, so we know WC. So we calculate WE, we got WC, so we can find delta P. I'm not going to write the equation down because I've got room on the whiteboard, but you can write down the equation, it's in the notes, there's nothing mysterious about it. And from that you find pressure. So you can actually find P, or more to the point PF, the final pressure at which the gas field is full of water and you're not producing any gas. And that pressure is a finite number, right? It's not absolute zero anymore. So what happens if you don't have any water in flux, you can drop the pressure, drop the pressure, drop the pressure, drop the pressure, the gas keeps expanding, expanding, expanding. Okay, you're left with a field full of gas, but at super low pressure, so you can get 90, 95%. With a water drive, the water moves in, it's pushing out the gas, that's great, but then the field is full of water. It leaves behind this residual gas. So when I say full, I mean only water is flowing. It leaves behind this residual gas at quite a high pressure. So it actually leaves behind more gas in terms of how many molecules its surface volume. Okay. So we find the final pressure, and then we can find BG because BG is a function of final pressure. Okay, so having done that, we can then put it in uh, the equation to find the gas produced. So that's what we're going to do. We are, I'm afraid, running out of space here, so I'm going to have to um, get rid of things no longer 100% essential. Okay, so it gives us a bit of room up here. So I'm now going to write what my gas produced is. Oops, um, black is equal to G. One minus BG, BG plus my water influx. I know I've got this G B G I one minus S G I okay, um, and that's divided by BG. Okay, so now we've got the terms here. If we notice, um, here's a G. And then one, and then there's minus BGI over BG, and then there's a plus BGI over BG. So this term and this term cancel. And I'm actually left with actually a much simpler equation, which is one, right, from here 
and then just this bit. Okay, so this is the final equation I'm going to show in this video sequence. The recovery factor, GP over G, the percentage that you recover, is now given by this equation, and it's a beautiful equation, very simple, but it includes two things. It's got one minus BG over BG. That's how much the gas expands. So clearly you want the gas to expand as much as possible. You want to drop the pressure as much as possible, but with a water drive gas, um, um, gas field, you're prevented from doing this. So this is the expansion of gas, this term. The second term is SGR over SGR. Clearly, you're going to recover more if the residual saturation, what you leave behind, is as low as possible. So it accounts for two things. It accounts for the expansion of the gas and it accounts for the change in saturation. It's quite um, elegant in that respect and you can put in the numbers. The other use of this equation is that there's nothing in this equation that says it has to be SGR, right? So if, you're, if you've got a water drive um, reservoir and you're some stage of production, you say, well, what is the average saturation in the field, right? You can use this equation if you know the pressure, so you know BG, and you measure G, you've found G from your material balance, so you know the recovery factor, and then you can rearrange this equation to find the average saturation. And it's not the residual, it's whatever the saturation is. So this equation is quite general. It's not a specific, oh, it's only for gas, or it's only if it's a specific residual in this complicated analysis. No, it's a general equation. It says the recovery factor is one minus the ratio of BGs, because that's expansion, and the ratio of saturation. So physically, it's quite general. Okay. And the reason why I emphasize this is we're going to find this equation again when we look at uh, oil field material balance, where I replace the G's with an O. And I don't want people sort of having to plot their way through every little step in the algebra, really worried about the specifics. In general, this equation is always going to work. It's a ratio of expansions. It's a ratio of saturations. I've gone through it in one specific reason, because I have a specific thing I want to look at but it's actually quite a, quite a general equation, quite, quite a powerful equation, actually, in material balance. And that's why I've, I've uh, highlighted it in red. OK, so I'm going to get rid of the whiteboard. OK, I'm going to conclude now. So that concludes my analysis of material balance for a gas field. And I do apologise, you know, with a pen and a whiteboard, it sounds very theoretical for what is rather a practical um, analysis. In the end, to understand what's going on, you have to take some data. You have to do the analysis yourself. But at least, hopefully, I've gone through the equations so you can understand what those equations are and why we're using them. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much.